Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Would you stand with us? We're going to sing and lift our hearts to the Lord this morning and celebrate our Savior Jesus. We love him, so we're going to sing it out. Here we go. that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But he came and he died and he rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave like mountains that stood in our way, but he came and he died and he rose. Those giants are dead now. This is our God, this is who he is. Sing it, he loves us. This is our God, and this is what he does. He saves us on the cross. took our breath away Faith so weak that we could barely pray But he heard every word, every whisper Now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of his faithfulness Never once did he fail Our God. 
Thank you. That was so good. Welcome this morning to church. Take a moment before you're seated. Say hello to someone near you. Ask them their name if you don't know it. You may be seated. Again, it's my joy to welcome you. My name is Michelle. I serve on the staff here at Bible Center. I have the joy of overseeing our outreach here locally as well as globally. One of the joys in being able to do that is to hear from our global partners. Yesterday, I received a short video text from Julian, who is in Romania. And this past weekend, they hosted a soccer tournament of champions. And at that soccer tournament, they were able to share the gospel, and they had 14 soccer players accept Christ this weekend. We support him with the offerings that you faithfully invest through the years. So you, if you've given here at Bible Center, you were part of that. We ask that you continue to give. Give generously, like Bible Center is known to do, to make a difference around the world as well as here. And if you've never given before, would you consider thinking about that, making an eternal difference with your finances? You can do that online, you can do it on the app, or you can do it here in the back of the auditorium. If you are new or newer with us, a guest with us today, we really want to connect with you. Here at Bible Center, we connect, we grow, and we multiply. And the first step to being part of this family is to connect with us. If you would, you could stop by the tent on the way back to your car. There's a bright yellow tent in the parking lot where Pastor Matt Garrison and Paula Tony are. They would love to meet you. They can answer any questions that you have and help you get connected here at Bible Center. We want to know you. Also, we want you to know that we, as a membership, voted to make some improvements at the Oakhurst campus. It is in very bad need of a new roof. That's bad grammar. But the roof very badly needs to be repaired. We've got lots of leaks over there, as well as HVAC that needs to be updated, and the Early Learning Center needs updates as well. We did vote. The membership voted to do that. We're going to fund that and pay for that with the tuition in the coming years. We wanted to make you aware of that. Today, Pastor John is going to continue our series, The Bible On, and we're talking about mental health today. I'm so glad that this is one of the topics he chose to talk about, not just because counseling is one of my passions, but because we want Bible Center to be a safe place to struggle. You belong here. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to fix everything first. This is a safe place to struggle. So I'm looking forward to that message. In John 14, 27, we read this. Jesus says, I am leaving with you a gift, peace of mind and heart. The peace I give is a gift to the world, is a gift the world cannot give. So do not be troubled or afraid. Jesus' peace is what makes the difference. But Jesus, let's pray to him now. God, thank you so very much for the individuals in this room. Thank you for the opportunity to come to church this morning. Lord, to come and worship you just as we are. You love us the way we are. Thank you for that, but thank you that you don't leave us there. You give us hope. You offer us peace. Lord, we pray that everything we say and do in this room today will bring honor and glory to your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue to worship. Would you stand with us? We introduced this song at Easter, and it just says, Holy forever. Our God is above all things, so we praise him from the bottom of our hearts. No matter what we're facing, no matter what we're going through, we can call to him. He is holy. 
so we trust you. And see you next time. For thousand generations falling down in worship, sing the song of ages to me. Jesus, every knee will bow and tongue will confess that he is Lord. His name is the only name by which we can be saved. Let's lift his name high today and give him the praise that he deserves. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name
Jesus, you are holy. You are above every name. There is no other name under heaven or on earth that is greater than that. Lord, I pray today that your name is greater than all thrones and dominions, all powers and positions, whatever leaders and rulers have come before, have come now or will come in the future. No one can take a candle to your name. Lord, I pray today as we listen to your word and we listen to the things that you are doing throughout the world, I pray that we would continue to lift your name higher and higher. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You may have a seat. So I'm Ryan Bandy. Uh, I'm the pastor of high school ministries and college and young adult ministries here at Bible Center Church. And I just led our most recent trip into Nicaragua. Our mission is to go to Nicaragua, to go to Cristo Rey, to serve the kids, to put on a BBS. That is our primary goal and mission. So every day when we went to Cristo Rey to do VBS, we drive past the dump, but there was one day that we actually went and walked through the dump and we saw adults, but we also saw kids that were working there to find different things that they can sell and make money for. Uh, we were able to provide them with a drink and a snack, but when it's 100 degree weather and there's smoke everywhere, um, that only does so much. That was probably one of the most eye-opening things that I experienced. Uh, seeing the people that work in the dump, there's a constant burning smell because all the trash is always burning. There's smog, there's smoke. We saw a uh, medical needle just on the ground and there, there were people there barefoot. I guess it was just eye-opening to see like, this is where people work for around $2 a day. So that's what they make getting recycling. We did a um, vacation Bible school camp for um, the kids in Cristo Rey. Um, and we gave them crafts, dances, um, worship music. We gave them little goodie bags um, and there was a lesson and just hung out with them for like three days. We would do like crafts to where we'd do like, neck. we'd make necklaces with beads and like one of the girls just like put it on my neck and like told me it was mine. You don't realize how much they don't have yet they're still willing to give you everything that you've given them and more. Like they'll just, they're not thinking about, oh, like I should keep this for myself. They're just like, oh, I wanna give it to you. Well, I decided to go to Nicaragua because everyone was talking about the kids and I love like helping with kids and I just love doing that type of stuff. And it was, it was a little chaotic at some points because the kids, obviously the language barrier sometimes was rough to get through, but everyone has a smile on their face and they don't care how they sound when they sing, they just sing and they don't, they don't care like about where they live. They just go out and live and, and love God every day. Like, that's, that's how I want to be. You have to make yourself small in order to see how big God is. And in America, you don't realize how big like you are. And then you go to somewhere where they have absolutely nothing, but are like happier than you, more content than you, more grateful than you. And you, like, like you just have to humble yourself. And I think it's, it's how you see God is not just like in your house or in your school, but he is so much bigger than what box you have put him into. It's so interesting to see for me that you don't need resources to worship in spirit and truth. You don't need anything. And they've, pro they've been proving that for years. And so the reason I think everybody should consider a trip like this is because of the radical change that it brings. Because you get them away from the distractions and the noise and the phones and all of this stuff. And it's not that God speaks to us louder in countries like Nicaragua. It's just that God is still speaking, but we've actually set aside the distractions and we can hear, you know? And when we hear, like, we can't walk away unchanged. Our lives have to be different, radically different.
so proud of this team and the time they took to go and invest in the students and families there in Nicaragua. And um, this is my second time having a child, a uh, student, on the trip. Last year we had two, and this year we had one. And the stories of, of life change that happen uh, in them when they come back and they just talk about how God has changed them and is working on their life are just phenomenal. Uh, this is an area of the world as a church that we want to continue to invest in. And so we are working hard. Michelle's leading us to, to work really hard to invest strategically around the world in places where we feel like we can make a pretty deep impact. Um, and so this is an area, this is our, our second student trip, uh, but we've had another trip as well. And we've got other trips that are planned now, and we're starting to come alongside of Beautiful Feet as a partner uh, with us. And so we're looking forward to how God's going to use these students, maybe in the future, uh, to go back in a different capacity. You know, maybe somebody goes back as a doctor or something like that in the future. Who knows? Um, but it's really cool to have an opportunity to, to invest in something over the long term. And so that's what we're hoping that God does in this ministry. Really grateful to Ryan and Stephanie and to our leadership team for taking the time to do this and the energy to do this. And the late nights and the early mornings and the blood, sweat, and tears and all the things that goes into to putting something like this together and helping us navigate this trip, and then to these students for, we talk about this a lot, that student ministry, high school ministry, I'm a student pastor at heart, that's just me, uh, but they're the tip of the spear for a church, and so they do things first in a lot of ways, um, and so they're leading us uh, as we go into this area of the world, and so we're grateful for them uh, and the way that they've done that. So we wanted to, we prayed for them as they went, but now we want to pray for them as they're back. That God would continue to use them and shape them and to use this moment in their life. Uh, many of them are heading into a next step, even into college and things like that. And so that God would use this moment in their life to change them, to give them a heart and a passion for people, to love people the way that God loves people. Um, and so we're going to pray for that now. So Michelle's going to come and pray. And I just invite you, if you would like to, to pray along with her, just extend a hand of solidarity. And let's pray over these students. Let's pray. God, you are so very good. Thank you for the opportunity for these young people and their leaders to go to Cristo Rey and to serve you with the gifts that they have. Lord, I pray for these young lives that they will continue to walk closely with you. Lord, may you guide every step of their lives. May they serve you with every day, every ounce of energy that they have. Lord, may we as a congregation continue to wrap around Cristo Rey, Nicaragua, and love the people there. We pray for the children today that are part of the Beautiful Feet program. We pray for Pastor Marcos and Maria as they are preparing to lead church later today there. Lord, may your spirit just work mightily in a people group that has nothing in the world's eyes but has everything in eternal eyes. Lord, bless them. Bless our ministry to them. Give us wisdom and guide us in the years ahead. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So proud of them, and like I said, that's an area of the world that you're going to hear more about, have more opportunities to uh, partner with in the coming days. You're starting to hear a little bit more about missions, and especially post-COVID, as we're able to re-engage around the world. Uh, Julian is going to be with us on May 5th to share on our Global Sunday, and so you hear a little bit more about his ministry as well. So some great things going on uh, around the world. Uh, this week is family night. It's our last family night of the year. So, and it's the third in this series, Talking to God. And so this year we've done three family nights on Be in Your Bible, Read God's Word, How to Read God's Word. And now we're on to the third in prayer, Talking to God. And those two things, being in the Bible and talking to God, are kind of the dialogue that we have 
with God. We hear from God through his word, and then we talk to him in prayer. And so that's a, a fantastic opportunity for you to join us on Wednesday night. And if that's not enough, that you're going to learn how to talk to the creator of the universe, we also will have ice cream. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so Husky's ice cream is what I've been told. Um, and so that's Wednesday night this week. We'd love to have you there with us. We're going to go to Philippians chapter 4 this morning. Philippians chapter 4 in your Bible. Philippians chapter 4. We're in a series that we're calling the Bible on. The Bible on. And this series is an outflow or the next step in the series that we did that led up to Easter. And so that series was called The Beautiful Gospel. We talked about the gospel and how it's core and foundational to us as Christians. And there's some things that we believe to be true that then shape our life, the way that we live our life. And so this series, The Bible On, is looking into that. So as a Christian, as someone who has accepted Christ as my Savior, who's now living in a way where I'm being transformed more and more into his image, how does the Bible teach me to live in the culture that we find ourselves in. And so that's what this series is. Last week, Mike started us off with a, a topic called identity, which is one of those words that you hear all around, all the time. He did a fantastic job of, of kickstarting this series. And we're going to pick up today, and we're going to move to the second one, which is mental health. We're going to look at what the Bible says about mental health. And what you're going to find as we go through this series is the first two really have to do with you, me, personally, individually, how we interface with God, and then how that affects us as we live in this culture. Then the second two are going to be how I now intersect with culture. We're going to look at politics next week. We're going to look at justice. And then past that, as we get to Mother's Day and the, and the week after, we're going to look at how then that helps me interface with relationships that are around me as we look at marriage and family and conflict and so this series is intended to help us understand how the Bible teaches us to intersect with our world. What does that look like? How do we live as Christians in this world? And so today we're going to look at mental health. Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 4. It says this, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely... Whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell on these things. Do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So when we think about a topic like mental health, the first thing that I want you to hear this morning is that in dealing with mental health, you come into this place and you think, you know, that's something that I've dealt with. You are not alone. You are not alone. In fact, dealing with mental health is a human thing. It's something that is common among us. It's something that we share Everyone in this room at some point in their life has dealt with something that has impacted your mental health. So the first thing you need to understand, when it feels like you're alone, and when it feels like you're navigating uncharted waters, you're not alone. You're not alone. In fact, culture has a growing awareness of mental health. Here's a definition of mental health. Mental health includes our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It affects how we think, feel, and act and helps determine how we handle stress, relate to others, and make choices. Mental health is largely the lens 
that we view the world through. You could call it a worldview. It's the way we see the world. Our feelings, the way we're feeling, kind of drive the way we see the world. And culture has this growing awareness that this is something that is happening. There are three things that you'll find if you look online and, and you study this a little bit. Three things that are identified in culture that are causes of mental illness in people. First, the first category is psychological factors. Psychological factors. So those things are things like loss. You've gone through loss in your life or you've dealt with abuse in your life. Things like that fall into this category of psychological factors. The second one is environmental factors. How you live, what you have seen from other people who are living, modeling, so to speak. Isolation or community, those types of things have to do with your environment. And then there's social factors. And that has to do with your relationships, the relationships that you have, the relationships that have, have brought pain or whatever that might be. It also has to do with economics and how that fits into your life and where you are socio socioeconomically and things like that. But social Factors have all been part of mental illness. Think about these stats. Almost 20% of Americans have a diagnosable mental illness. Mike mentioned this last week. That's one in five have a diagnosable mental illness. That's not someone who says, I just struggle because I'm a little sad. That's a diagnosable mental illness. Almost 46% will experience one in their lifetime. You are not alone. 42.5 million Americans have been diagnosed with anxiety disorders. 21 million have depression disorders. 6% struggle with PTSD of some form. And close to 5% have experienced suicidal thoughts. You're not alone. This is something that humans struggle with. So, I'm going to state an obvious thing. I am not a doctor. I don't even play one on TV. Okay, I'm not a doctor. And so I'm not here to talk about those things. In fact, I'm incredibly grateful for people who are trained in that way, even people among us who are trained as physicians and therapists who can help in these areas. I'm so grateful for medications that have been developed and, and the way that God has given us brains and minds and creative ability and, and we can solve some of these problems. I'm so grateful for those things. And you may need that kind of help in your life. But here's what I am here to say you also need the Bible you also need the Bible it may be that you need more than the Bible you need therapy you need medication for chemical balance whatever it might be you might you might need more than that but you do not need less than that you have to have the Bible in your life and that's my job and so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. When we looked at those definitions of mental health from culture, definitions that you can find if you Google it, you will find that culture misses the most important aspect. Misses the most important aspect. Go to verse 4 of Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your graciousness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Don't worry about anything, but in everything, through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. There is a core belief system for a Christian that includes this core belief that God creates. That there is a creator and that he has made me. That I am a creation of God. In our previous series, The Beautiful Gospel, we looked at this core belief system. How God has created but then sin has broken. 
And so God sent Jesus as the Savior to rescue us from our sin. And now is doing the work in our life of transforming us. And then ultimately there will be no struggle with mental health because God will restore all things. It's the core belief system of a Christian. It's the gospel. It's what everything else extends from and flows from. So there's this core belief system in a, in a Christian that says God creates. So he creates us. Emotionally, he creates us psychologically, he creates us socially, but he also creates us spiritually. He also creates us spiritually. And if you miss that part, you miss all of it. You miss all of it. Look at what Jesus says in Mark chapter 12. He has this conversation with the religious leaders of the day. It says, one of the scribes approached and when he heard them debating and saw that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which command of all the commands that are found in the Bible, which command, Jesus, is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, he said, the most important is this, listen Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The emotional, the spiritual, the mental, and the physical. All, the whole being, the whole being. Within the Bible, there is not this separation between the physical and the heart, or the heart and the mind, like we tend to do in our Western culture. When Jesus was speaking this way, he was speaking about the whole person. In fact, the word mind is unique to the New Testament from the Old, and it's found several times throughout the New Testament. This word here is used 12 times in the New Testament, dianoia. And it's, it's this word that means reasoning. So he's saying, love the Lord with your reasoning. There's another word, nous, that's used 24 times in the New Testament. It's used in Romans chapter 12, and it can mean disposition. But in the Old Testament, there's not a direct translation for what we would call the mind. And so often in the Old Testament, what you'll find is the word heart instead. Because they're looked at as being the same thing. They're the center of a person. And so when Jesus is saying this, he's not splitting it up and saying, okay, you got this part does this and this part loves this way. and this." No, the whole being, he's, he's, he's pulling in the whole being. He's saying, all of you needs to love God. All of you needs to love God. It's not a separate thing. But also, in the New Testament, we're taught several things about the mind. We're taught that the mind can be evil. Romans tells us that. Colossians tells us that. Ephesians tells us that. We're told it can be renewed or it can be revived. Romans tells us that as well. And we're told that God's laws are put into our mind in Hebrews. And so this concept of mental health, this, this concept of our mind, and sometimes the battle that we, that we face in our mind is all the way through the New Testament. And this concept of mental health lives in the characters that we meet throughout the Bible as well. It's something that not only do we struggle with that, where it's a common thing among us in our culture as humanity, but it's also common back throughout humanity and even includes Jesus himself. Jesus went through loss of one of his best friends, Lazarus. David had an enemy in Saul who was trying to kill him. Paul faced injustice when he was thrown in prison. Peter faced failure. When he denied Christ and on and on and on we could go. Mental health is a human thing. You are not alone. You're not alone. And this is a result of the brokenness in our world caused by sin. So our struggle with mental health. Maybe you struggle at a, at a deep level or maybe you struggle at a not quite as deep level with it. But our struggle with mental health can lead to us feeling wrong. 
We don't really have words to put on it sometimes. We just know that I feel off. I feel wrong. I feel bad. I we struggle to wrap other words around it. We just feel wrong. So here's where we go today. We can't feel right without thinking right. We can't feel right without thinking right. Look at verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any moral excellence, and if there is anything praiseworthy, dwell, think on these things. So part of our core belief system, believing that God creates and that there is is a creator is that we also believe that there is something that is true there is something that is good there is something that is commendable there is something that is honorable when we read a list like this when we believe in God and we believe in who he is we believe that there is something that is true it's part of our core belief system so if God created then As we talked about in that series, if God created out of his goodness, and as we looked at last week in Psalms, how God created with intricacy and care and love every detail of us, if that's true, then that means that God's design is what leads to human flourishing. God's design is what leads to human flourishing. So part of this journey with mental health and and learning to think right as we experience these emotions, as we're dealing with these things that are telling us stuff, they're telling us lies about ourselves. we have to go back to this core belief that God created. And how did he create? He created with intricacy. He created with care. He created with purpose. And he gave us purpose. And his design, as the designer is what leads to human flourishing. That's a core truth. Because as you're struggling with those things, you're going to get all kinds of answers to the questions of how do I get happy and how how do I find joy and all of those answers are going to come flooding at you. But here's what, what, where that takes us. God creating, here's what that takes us. Happiness was his idea. He invented happiness. He invented joy he invented purpose he invented all of those things they came from God he created all of that and so if I'm searching for that then I honestly I I should be going back to him and looking at what he says about those things his design for me is what takes me that way think about it when we talked about God creating he he created people and he put us in a garden he said this is all yours Use it, love it, enjoy it, experience it. Everything that you have, everything that you need, it's all right here. I've taken care of all of it. I've designed you to enjoy this. He's the one who designed gender. He's the one who designed marriage. He's the one who designed purpose. It all comes back to him. And his design is what leads us to human flourishing. All of these emotions were his idea. And so he can teach us how to truly experience that. So we have to believe at our core that his design is the best thing for me and it's the best thing for all of humanity. It's the best thing for me and for everyone. His design. So then we have to ask the question how do we know what his design is for me 
and for all of humanity. How do we know? When I'm struggling and things are pulling at me, how do I know what his design is? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It sets up this tension that we feel. Paul says, do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. There's this ongoing process that happens in our life of renewing my mind. It's this renewing of my mind. And God doesn't just leave us alone for that to take place. In fact, he gives us some things. It's why we talk about the habits that we talk about so much. Because ultimately, there's an input system that has to take place where I am learning God's design for me, and I am learning God's design for humanity. And so he's given us some things for that to happen. He's given us his word. And so this year we're talking about being the Bible, being the Bible, being the Bible. You need to read the Bible. You need to study the Bible. You need to understand the Bible. You need to apply the Bible to your life. You need to be in the Bible. That's one of the gifts that he's given us for the renewing of our mind so that we can understand what his design is for us and for humanity. He's also given us God's people. The church, the people around you, the people beside you, those are gifts, whether you believe it or not. They're gifts from God to you as you are seeking to renew your mind so that you can understand God's design for you and for humanity. The people around you are God's gift to you to help you on that journey. And then he's given us his spirit, his Holy Spirit, to indwell us, to empower us, to equip us. As we live in this world. We have to know what God's design for humanity is. Just this morning, one of our members sent me an article, another article, on the benefits of being part of a church. It's from the Wall Street Journal, from a a secular publication. There are more and more articles that are coming out that just say there are so many benefits to being part of a church. They're not even Christian benefits. They're just being part of a church, the community that happens, the purpose that happens, the accountability that happens. And what we've seen over the last several years, in in particular as we've left COVID, is we've seen this skyrocketing of mental health stuff in our country. And we've seen this decrease of church engagement and church involvement. Those things are gifts to you from God for you to know his design for you and for humanity so that you can live that way. And so we have to prioritize that. We have to lean into that because there's a major difference between God's message and the message of culture. There is a major difference between God's message and the message of culture. And that's not just true today. That's been true forever. And it will be true forever. Until Jesus comes. There's a difference. Culture's message and God's message are in conflict with each other. In opposition to each other. And so Paul here in Romans 12 says, Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed. He sets up that tension between the two things. This age. And so he was writing to people who lived about 2,000 years ago, and he's even saying it then, and it applies to us now. Do not be conformed to this age. And that's this, this, over time, I'm being more and more shaped to resemble and to look like this age. And he contrasts that, and he says, instead, instead of being conformed to this age, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can know what is good. It's so confusing in our world today, in our culture today, to even know and understand what is good anymore. What is right. 
because that message just inundates us over and over again from so many different sources. I can't expect to be able to discern good from evil, right from wrong, God's way from the world's way, if my only input is from the culture that I'm trying not to become like. I can't expect that. Because culture redefines everything. Some of the things we looked at last week. Culture says follow your heart. Live your truth. You deserve this. Do what makes you happy. It's a competing worldview with the way of Jesus. And if that's your only input, if that's the only thing that you're getting into your life, then you will be conformed to this age. You won't be able to help it because that's the only input you got. That's shaping your thinking. And so you have to go back to core foundational truth. You have to go back to what is true, what is good, what is lovely, what is commendable. You have to think on those things. You have to have input from those things. And then we get different answers to the questions. Those questions that we asked about identity last week apply to mental health. Do I matter? Am I seen? Do I fit and belong? How do I find acceptance or love? Is there any joy in this world at all? Why do I feel so broken all the time? If our only input is the message of culture, then those messages tend to shape our answers, which shapes our identity. It shapes how we think, who we are. And they were never meant to shape your identity. It can't hold up under that pressure. We look at things, or vices, or addictions, or escapes. Or relationships. And we expect those things to be our God. To save us. To give us joy. To give us happiness. It is not fair for you to expect another person to provide that for you. Your relationship with the created cannot bear that weight. It's not what it was designed for. Your relationship with, with something else that was created will never, ever, ever satisfy your need for a relationship with the creator himself. And when you place that expectation on someone else or something else, it will crumble under that pressure. And culture says pursue that. Find the right person. Find the right career. Find the right car. Find the right drug. Find the right whatever. And you'll finally get it. And God says he's the only one that can hold up to that expectation. Those two messages are in conflict. God's messages tells us that those relationships with his people and with the things that he has made for us, they extend from a relationship with him. And they're designed to be enjoyed through a relationship with him. As we get into marriage and, and family and we talk about all those things, we're going to find the design of God it's not that your spouse is going to be your savior. They're not going to fix you. That's a relationship that God has given you that extends from the relationship with him. He's your savior. 
And now you're free to love because you have a savior. They live in tension. So as Christians, what do we do? We understand that transformation is ongoing. Transformation is ongoing. So we talked about how Jesus saves, and that's a moment in time where Jesus saves, but then it enters us into this relationship, this ongoing relationship where God is changing me more and more. So I become more and more made in the image of Christ. This transformation is ongoing. Look at verse 9. Paul says, after he says, think about these things, he says, now do what you have learned and received and heard from me and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. So as my mind is renewed and I'm able to start thinking right, I'm able to discern right and wrong, good and evil, God's message and culture's message, what is good and pleasing to God, I'm able to discern that. Then the next step for me is to do what's right. It's to do what's right. Paul says, think about all these things. Dwell on these things. These things that are true. These things that are lovely. But then the second step, and many times the harder step, is do. I need to do what's right. And that step, that step takes sacrifice. Doing what is right takes sacrifice. Back to Romans 12, verse 1. He says this in verse 1. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. I'm not blind to the fact that following Christ, following the way of Jesus, costs us things. There's sacrifice involved. Maybe for you, as you hear that this morning and you think about you know, I can discern right and wrong, but I just don't want to give this thing up because to sacrifice that thing is going to be too much for me. Maybe it's a relationship that you have. Maybe it's an addiction that you have. Maybe it's a certain ideal that you have. Maybe it's a career that you have. Maybe it's the way you function in a career that you have. To do what's right takes sacrifice. It's a step forward into Jesus' way. It's part of transformation. He transforms me from the inside out. So that the way I look physically, the way I act physically matches what's happening in my heart. This is why we talk about Bible Center being a safe place to struggle. Because every single person that walked in this room this morning, including myself, has something that we need to lay down and sacrifice to Jesus as Lord. All of us do. All of us have a step forward into something that says Jesus is Lord over this. Jesus is Lord over that. And so we struggle together because this is God's gift to us that we can struggle together. By the power of his spirit with God's people as we study his word, we can struggle together. Because there's grace for that. But we encourage each other, we exhort each other, we challenge each other. Take that step forward. Sacrifice it. Because Jesus' way is better. And then there's a promise at the end. Verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. He promises peace at the end of the path. It doesn't mean that in this world all the struggle goes away and everything's fine and your mental health is good from now on. There's a promise 
a supernatural peace. Now and forever. This peace in the Bible is a theme that runs through the whole Bible. It's a great study to look at peace throughout Scripture. And peace just literally basically means the absence of war. It's the opposite of war. In the Old Testament, the word was a word that some of us are familiar with, the word shalom. This word shalom basically just means wholeness or restored state. People would greet each other with this, I'm longing for peace, I'm longing for wholeness, I'm longing for this restored state. I remember when Allison was uh, about two years old, we went on vacation to Hilton Head. And if you've ever been to that area of the world, the beach is huge. I mean, just like massive. So from the water to the, to the back, whatever the back is called, long way, just massive. And she's two and she's playing in the sand, you know, building sand castles. We're doing our thing back and forth in the water and back and all that. And there was a moment where we lost her. A lot of people on the beach, a lot of activity, huge beach, and we lost her. And we're young parents, and everything that we just talked about, anxiety, worry, all panic, I mean, boom, just floods you. We just lost our child. What are we going to do? And so we're running around frantically looking, looking, looking in the water, you know, worst case scenarios popping our head, everything, we're just, it's just frantic all over the place. And it was probably about five minutes, which seems like about five days when you're in the middle of that. And we finally found her, and she's, she's making sandcastles where she was before. She didn't do anything wrong. She was still there. But that moment when you are at war, and then there's a moment where just peace floods your soul. That's this promise. It's hard for us to wrap words around that sometimes. We just know it. When we have it. We can't really explain it to someone else. It's just, yeah, I have it. It's supernatural. Verse 7, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus said this in John 16. He said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. In John 14, Jesus says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I don't give as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled or fearful. Peace is the greatest indicator of trust in our life. Do you want to know if you trust God, how much peace do you have? It's the promise. It's the promise that follows the, I think right, I take a step forward, even though it's sacrificial, but I do what is right. It's the promise that I'm going to feel peace. Supernatural peace. In the middle of struggle, in the middle of turmoil, in the middle of the storm. Peace. From God. You know, these emotions that we experience. When we live a life. That is centered on the gospel. And we think about mental health. Centered on the gospel. These emotions that we experience, they actually can be part of God's gifts to us. Think about it for a second. Because they become opportunities for us to grow. They become opportunities for us to be transformed more and more into the image of Christ. They become opportunities for me to trust more. When I experience anxiety, what is that telling me? It's telling me here's a place that I can trust God more. Because I'm anxious. Because I... I'm losing what I feel like is control. 
So when that anxiety is triggered, it can trigger this response in you if, you think, if you're thinking right, where I step forward and say, God, I'm going to trust you more. When I'm experiencing depression, there's an opportunity in there for me to hope more. God, you're going to make everything new. You're going to make everything right. You're going to restore all things. I'm going to hope more in you. When I'm going through hardship or trial, I can count it joy because he's working on me. He's present with me. He's shaping me. He's molding me more into his image. I want to go through grief. It's an opportunity for celebrating ultimate restoration and ultimate resurrection. These emotions, when viewed through the lens of scripture, become gifts that God uses in our life to change us more into the image of his son. So may we be people of the word people who study our Bibles to discern what is good and pleasing. And may we be people who want to sacrifice our way of thinking to live the way of Jesus. And may we be people who don't have peace in spite of our circumstances, but peace because of our God. You bow your heads and close your eyes with me. I'm going to give you a few moments as the band sings to just consider what the Lord has for you today. What is it that you're struggling with? Is it the right thinking? Are you able to discern what is good and pleasing? Are you confused? Maybe it's the sacrificial step. God, I know what's right. I just don't want to give that up. Maybe it's a need for peace. God, I pray that you would just give me peace in my soul that only comes from you, that surpasses understanding. Spend some time with the Lord as the band sings this over you.
If you'd like to talk to somebody today, there'll be some prayer partners that'll be available at the front of the room at the end of the service. We'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Don't carry stuff by yourself. Use the gift that God's given us. Come and pray with somebody. If you can't do that, there are boxes in the back of the room. You can write something down, and our staff takes some time on Mondays to pray over those things. We'd, we'd be honored to pray with you. Maybe you've been wrestling with all of this stuff. And today's the day you need to receive Christ as your savior. We'd love to pray with you about that, to make today the day of your salvation. We love you so much. If we can help, we're here to serve. Let's stand up and let's sing as we close out today.
children now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were on his faithfulness and his faithfulness alone. We praise the Lord for that. If you need prayer this morning, our prayer partners are ready to pray with you, to receive you in that and help you through those moments together. If you're newer, newer to us, meet Matt and Paula out front. They would love to connect you to our church family. We want to know who you are. We want you to be a part and really well connected to this church family. Our God is amazing, and we pray that he blesses you as you go from this place, living in full trust of who he is. We love you. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.